So, I just the, the question that was asked by the previous speaker, which I was going to ask first, was that how many carriers in this audience? And I know now the number three. That says something. And the next question is how many marketeers in this audience? All right. So that's a significant number. And how many vendors then? I mean, basically, that should be the rest of it, right? Because if you're not a vendor, if you're not a carrier, then why are you here, like me? <laughs> right? OK. Anyways, I'm a professor. I'm neither of the two. And, so, and I'm also the last speaker. So what I decided to do was to raise some flames. Because I'm a professor, so I can say anything I want. I don't have to worry about the company coming after me and saying, your product will not sell anymore. And so let's see. Let me start. By the way, uh, you don't have to take picture of any of these slides. They're all available on the URL, which will be on every page. So you can download right now or later. Doesn't matter. Now, <clears throat> so my talk is about open ADN, service chaining of globally distributed VNS. Sounds like a very technical topic. So before that, I just want to go into answering some of the questions that have been discussed n times in this conference. First is, what will the telco look like in three years? Then I want to talk about SDN 1 and 2. Then I want to talk about NFV and service chaining. That's, my, that's the main part of my talk. Then I want to change that, remove the word network, and then functional virtualization and service chaining, and tell you why. And then open ADN. So what will the service look like in three years? What will the telco look like in three years? This is how. Basically, this has been the case for the last three years. Every year, the, the vendors have come and told them that this is the thing to be in, which is different from what we told you last year. OK? 2010, it was open flow. The word SDN was not invented then. 2011, it was SDN. 2012, right about this time, October or November, they told us NFV. And 2013, SDN 2.0, and I will tell you what that is. Now, there's a problem. I mean, I have been with the telco market, by the way. I'm a professor, but I have gone through the whole cycle of startups and everything else. And the telcos have a reason for moving slow. And the reason is that they are not like us, like the enterprise companies which you want to sell to them. They have infrastructure business, which requires billions of dollars of hardware, software, analog, this and that everything that you cannot just move like the, like the vendors can. All right? And by standards itself, they used to take 10 years to move from one generation to the next generation. And it has not changed, by the way. 3G to 4G is 10 years exactly. OK? 3G was called um, something dash 2000 EM something. I forgot the number. So it takes 10 years still today. WiMAX started in 2001, it became LT in 2005, and deployed in 2010, first deployment, right? The second part we forget in, in many of these things, discussions here is that a lot of part of carriers is also analog. The whole herds, megahertz, spectrum, then the, the, the base stations and the antennas, they're all analog. They cannot be virtualized. I mean, they cannot easily be virtualized right now. It's actually here, I think. Let me correct myself. I think there is a there is an opportunity for somebody to come around and, and virtualize analog, just like, just like you know, hardware companies are virtualizing hardware itself, and, 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 and SRIOV is one example. But right now, it doesn't really happen. You can't have too many virtual antennas in one. <clears throat> so they are like an elephant, and we are like horses, and we want them to run like us. All right, and that's what the mismatch is. We all come to the conferences to find out the latest stuff. They are still busy managing the old stuff. So the technology is changing so fast. Basically, two thousand nine up until two thousand one, there was no word and software defined networking. By the way, SDN. March two thousand eleven, the ONF was formed. There was no word SDN. Otherwise, they would have called it software defined foundation or something like that. It was still open. October 2011 is when SDN was invented. 
first meeting, and I was there actually in that meeting. November 2012, NFV was invented. It was not here. It was done in Europe. And April 2013, when the second ONF meeting came, it's then that um, the whole thing changed. Basically, in the second meeting, which was right here in Silicon Valley, actually in, in the next door, Open Daylight was announced. All right, and those of you who are keeping track of Open Daylight, it is bring your own plugin style. You can bring whatever protocol you like, and it will take it, and that is SDN version 2. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that, because yesterday there were many talks, and today there were many talks where people still talk about separation of control plane, data plane, and all that. That is no longer SDN. All right, so let me make, explain that one. So first of all, SDN, and you know, it's basically none of these. Some people think that SDN overflow, that is kind of clear by now, it's not. Some people think that SDN is a standard southbound OPI, that means one, one protocol, which it is not. Some think, people think that it is centralization of separation of, sorry, it is separation of control plane and data plane, it's not. And it is centralization of control plane, it is not. So what it is then? If it is none of these things. If you thought any of these are SDN, then I will correct you in a minute as to why it is not. And the problem is that we are all, these are all mechanisms. And nobody wants to buy a mechanism, they want to solve a problem. And I have gone through this cycle once, when we were doing ATM, ATM was a mechanism for us to get very high quality service, QoS, with circuit switch networks, supporting both voice and data. However, when the people found out a better way of doing the same thing, they rejected that whole mechanism and went with MPLS. So really, people are not buying any mechanism. They want to see where you get me, and can I get there without with, with different method. Right? So whichever, whoever takes us to the goal where we, we want to get to in the fastest, cheapest, easiest way is what will win. So I'm going to tell you, first, I mean, before I tell you what, what is the fastest, cheapest way is that SDN 1.0, we all know it was based upon OpenFlow. Actually, OpenFlow has the credit for inventing SDN, because if OpenFlow would not have happened, SDN would not have happened. Basically, what happened was OpenFlow people were trying to figure out how to do research and production in the same network. Remember 2008. If you were around in 2008, and if you knew OpenFlow, you know that is the problem they were doing, how to do their own research in a production network at Stanford. Right? So they found out, and they found out, oh, this is very, very good. Now, it's not only two people. Even n tenants can share it. So they found out a multi-tenant method, which is really good. Then they found out that if we have a central controller, then we can easily program it. So they found out that it is software defined. By the time it was, they found that out, it was 2011, by the way. And so they said, well, OpenFlow is SDN. And so everybody is telling the same story even today. But the definition has changed. Even if you go to ONF today, ONF definition is right here, and this is the definition I took down from their website just yesterday, so it is, it is their definition. A physical separation of network control plane from forwarding plane, and so on, so on, so forth. The problem with this definition is that it tells me again how. How to do software-defined networking. It doesn't tell me what. Now, this is what the problems are. This is the problems that the carriers have. That's the problem I think that the carriers have. First of all, they want to virtualize. Why they want to virtualize? Because virtualization helps us do many things, such as we don't have to have physical infrastructure. We can have somebody else's physical infrastructure. We can put our virtual piece over there. Just every advantage of the cloud is there with virtualization. Orchestration. We have so many users, so many varieties, so many devices. We want to do them at the same time. Programmability, we want to be able to change. Look, there is no word control plane here. Programmability. Dynamic scaling, I want to be not be like this, some speaker said this earlier this morning, that you don't want to be having the whole infrastructure for Christmas Day on other days, right? Scalability. Automation, we don't want to really have people to do every little thing. Visibility, enough talk today. Performance. And we want to really optimize the network device utilization. We don't want to have something 10% utilized, and so on and so forth, and 
multi tenancy obviously nowadays there is nothing single tenant service integration we want to have different kinds of services and openness now openness is misunderstood open some people whose name start with open will define openness as one protocol so that means openness of openness uh, means standard protocol they call it and without any right and other people will call it modular means anybody can come in like this open door all right so you take your definition but um, i just wanted to tell you one more thing since there are so many people from marketing i don't know how many people know google trends four or five okay all right if you don't know if you are in marketing you need to know because in the marketing day and night you are talking about trends and i found out that all the trend reports that we pay we pay for $7000 at $10,000, you can get it from Google for free. What it is is Google Trends, and this slide, by the way, is also in the package, so you can just download anytime you want. The URLs is in the, in, in the bottom. Is that you can put any word and say how many people are searching for it and when they search for it, time by time. All right? So now, you see, SDN started, you can figure it out when SDN started. Because when you look for software defined networking, there was nobody looking for it in 2010. Okay? And then another point Google does is it tells you what happened that day. So these are the news items A, B, C, D, E, F, G, B. That day, open daylight was announced, and suddenly, and now it takes a turn. All right? You look for NFV. NFV started at the end of 2012, so it looks like 2013 there. <coughs> but you see it is still going up, and there is not much uh, actually news about it. But this is a very, very useful tool for anything that you want to sell, network visibility, network performance. You just see how many people are wanting that problem, are looking for that, that term. All right? So having said that, so now you know when SDN began. Now what did Open Daylight do? Open Daylight basically said that we don't want this single plugin style, as we don't want a single protocol style. We want to go to whatever protocol we have, we want to use it. Because the key goal, and I will show you in a minute, those 10 things is what we want to get, and none of these say control plane. All of these, basically, if you want to sum summarize in one, is programmability and orchestration. I want to do minimum, mini, million things in one second, right? So I can do that by many other methods. And so people are now talking about SMTP, XMPP, BGP. And so this is what Open Daylight is. You can go to Open Daylight web page and look up as to how many different protocols they're designing for your SDN. And this is what I call no open flow. This is like no SQL. Those of you who know big data, you know what is no SQL? Not only SQL. NO is not only SQL. So no open flow is not that you don't want open flow. Yes, we want open flow, but we can have other things too. All right? And so another thing that they have done, Open Delight people have done, is they have moved the work to another open forum called IETF. So if you have not looked up recently at IETF, please do. Because they are working on programming the network. They are working on things like I2RS, you know, network visibility, PCEP, XMPP. All of these things, they were working on something totally different. Now they are working on programming the network for you. All right? So very soon you will see that a whole new set of methods will be discovered for doing, solving those 10 problems. All right, this is SDN 2.0. And um, one more thing is that networking has been like a religion, and please don't take any particular religion or anything in mind, but we are all have different religion, and we have a different point of view. And uh, basically, that's what I find in networking too. When we had ATM, we, there was religion. When we had Ethernet and token ring, we had religion. When we had um, very recently RPR, we had religion. And so, 
so there are very, very strong views, very strong views, and then people will say, no, no, you are wrong, and so that, may, that might be it, who knows, but basically you have to distinguish why do you need control plane separation. Separation of control plane means that we take away your brain, give you the data plane, and put the whole control plane in one place. It has its advantages. It has its advantages. But if we leave the control plane in place, we can still have control. We still have control. The point is that if we have a team where everybody is going in different direction, then that is not good. That is how the network was up until now. The routers were totally independent. There was no central point of control. Right? But if we tell a router, look, you should do it like this, and then you can use your brain for the rest of it. There will be a lot less communication between the controller and the controlled. This is how the real world is controlled. President Obama says one sentence. He doesn't go to the million people and tell them you should do this. He doesn't micromanage. Right? He tells five people who report to him. They tell five people who report to them. They tell five people who report to them. And suddenly, 200 million people are registering for whatever that he wants to do. Right? So, so the idea is we want to do orchestration, but orchestration can be done in many different ways. All right. So now what is NFC for? It turns out the problems have not changed from 10, 2010 to 2012. Right, December 2012. It's just that somebody thought that it's great, SDN, software defined. Why don't we just do it in the software? And same 10 problems, it turns out all of these can be done in the software with the NFB. All of these can be done with the NFB. Same problems, I won't change the list. Tell me if one of these cannot be done. I saw some Venn diagram will say, oh, well, this cannot be done. Uh, tell me that. I will show you something cannot be done, which in a minute. But basically, most of these, all of these can be done. And so we have NFB. And actually, a good thing about NFB is, while NFB is also a mechanism, that means virtualization. But I don't know. I mean, right now, at least, nobody has figured out how to get the same virtualization usefulness. And virtualization is somehow also a proven technology. We have been doing virtualization for, you know, since, oh, since um, uh, let me see the date. <laughs> I, I, whenever the uh, Amazon announced AWS, which was the beginning of, of cloud computing, about five, six years ago. All right? So now I'm back to VNF. All right? So the first thing is, first thing is that um, NFV, people talk about NFV, NFV is network function virtualization, and VNF is just a little bit tricky is virtual network functions, VNFs. So all of the VMs are called VNFs. And generally what happens is you have VNFs which are replicated because if you need a, let's say, um, CDN, you won't have just one CDN, you will have N CDNs, VMs. And then um, you will have to decide which CDN to go to for what. And then you do service chaining. What is service chaining? Service chaining is basically deciding how the packets will go from which service to which service, and not only which service, but also which instance of that service. Because each service has multiple instances. Right? And so this whole chain is called service chaining. The main problem, though, is the service chaining is based upon content and context. So what is content? Well, if I want to serve a video, if it is SD, I want to serve it from S1. If it is HD, I want to serve it from S2. Network context. If it, S1 is broken, then I want to send it from S2, and, and so on and so forth. Application context. Reads go to one, one instance. Writes go to another instance. You, you have two copies, but you don't want the writes to go to both copies. If the load on one is high, you go to the second one. User context. If it is a phone user, we send it to this one. If it is a laptop user, we send it to that one. And much of this so far is done stati statically in the sense that you just decide, OK, well, we will go from here to there and there to there. And um, if something doesn't work out, for example, if the load goes up or the link gets broken and so on and so forth, it will just 
that user will not get the benefit, right? But SDN can help. SDN can help here because dynamically, you see the virtualization does not give you dynamic dynamics. With virtualization, you get scale, you get manageability, you get everything else that we had 10 things on the list. But what you don't get is to change it an instant notice. Again, you need some software, you can call that SDN, you can call it orchestrator, you can call it whatever you want to say. But basically something that changes the characteristics of a network in a second is what we need. Right? And that's what I, you know, basically, so, so the idea is we have something which we can call a middle box which decided, decides which VNF to go to. These are three copies. And we want to go to one of these three and we have to decide. So we have to look into that. And so this is very similar to the thing that we heard in the few, last few talks. You look at the headers and you look at the packet load and you decide where to go. Right? They decide how to count. Here we decide where to go. Well, this is where SDN can help is that you have a central controller and somebody tells the policies and then that controller can immediately program all the boxes. The boxes haven't lost their brain, they still have their brain. But they can program all the boxes to do according to the current policy. Okay, so this is where we want to use SDN. Now, so SDN basically service infrastructure separation. So now there is another thing which is happening with, with NFV. And that basically is that cloud computing. That is coming from cloud computing. What cloud computing did was it did the service and the infrastructure separation. So physical infrastructure is owned by Amazon and Google, and all the services are owned by the rest of us. And this is a win-win combination. Why it is it a win-win combination? Because I don't have to pay that much as I would have paid if I had the physical infrastructure. And the Amazon wins because they sell it to 2,000 people who don't use the infrastructure anyway. Right? So sharing is good. And so with virtualization, the same thing ISPs can do. If either they don't have to own the infrastructure, so basically some ISPs, the big ones, can probably own the infrastructure, but they can share it with other people, other ISPs, who can basically do and don't use any physical infrastructure, but just rent it out for the time that they need it. Now they will both win. They will both win because the big one can share the cost of the infrastructure, which is very high as we saw earlier. And the small one basically thinks that, okay, I can cover the whole area, but only pay for the use. So it's a win-win combination. So I can see that basically this is going to start whole new kinds of services, which exist right now, but they're not dynamic enough. So right now you can see lots of, there are lots of mobile carriers who use Sprint services or at and services and so on and so forth, and all they do is billing. But um, they can't really set up a tower in a day. They can't really um, just create services like you know, an instance. And that can really change the whole business. So service chaining in a multi-cloud, multi-tenant environment. So now we are going to use one more, we are going to use one more um, dimension, and that is that services will not reside in one cloud. So here's the thing. If you want to put everything in one cloud, then you know, the, your cloud provider will probably take care of it. You tell them and they will chain it whatever way you want. But if it is in multiple clouds, and particularly if it is multiple clouds are not from the same provider. If you have five clouds, one is in Japan with some Japanese provider, and one is in USA with some US provider, which is kind of the norm. And so then you can't really control the whole service. You, know, you really have, you need some place to where you can control the whole service, right? How do you do that? So now you have, you have many services, but they're now in multiple clouds, and obviously multi-tenant is another dimension of this, is that you, you don't own the whole thing, right? And whoever is going to do this, they have to look at your L7 payload. So there was a question asked before, what do you do with the payload is encrypted, right? And anyway, even if the payload is not encrypted, I wouldn't like Google to look at my payload or at and to look at my payload, which they are doing right now, but, um, but basically <laughs> that's the reason I would rather have it encrypted. All right, so these are the challenges in service chaining. First is it has to be dynamic. That means I should be able to take care of the problem as soon as it happens. Content sensitive, distributed control. Now here's the distributed control. 
I want the, 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 the infrastructure provider doesn't want you to touch their infrastructure. They don't want you to touch their physical network anyway, right? And the, and the tenant doesn't want the, infra, the, the, the apartment owner to touch their content at all, all right? So this is the problem, right? Third is massive scale. Fourth, so the, previously we didn't even think about this, but now we can do per user optimization. We can do you know, lots of things that we could not do before because now you know, we, we are able to, right? Massive scale. And, it's, it's, and then the problem comes up. Fourth, fifth problem is stateful services. The problem is, and this has not been talked about in this forum yet, is that many of the flows cannot just be randomly selected and sent because if you send the first packet to this CDN, you have to send the rest of the packet to that same CDN. Right? So there is a state there, somewhere. It has to be kept. Right? And so before I give you the solution, I just want to increase the problem one more step. And that is, why network function virtualization? Why not just any function virtualization? What is so special about the network? When the carriers have come up with this idea of NFV, they could just remove the N and offer FB as a service. Banks will love it, right? Any person who is running a game, mobile game, such as um, Killing the World, I forget the name. So you know, any game person who is running a global game all over the world, they need connectivity to their VNN, VNs running over the cloud. They will love it if the carrier somehow did it for them. Right? So I'm going to remove N for the time being. So basically, everyone can benefit from functional decomposition of their industry and virtualization of those functions and service chaining of those functions. And carriers in the, are in the ideal situation to do this. So now I'm going to talk about VF chaining. VF chaining in a multi-cloud, multi-tenant environment, and actually some of it is already done. Some of it is already done. Google and Akamai already use this kind of service chaining. When you go to Google, they take your packet from here and they send it to the right place, exactly this right place, wherever it's supposed to go, using their virtual machines. And this is how they do it. The way they do it is that they, they have Google proxy boxes at every ISP. And ISP is very happy to have that Google proxy box because 90% of the traffic is going to Google anyway. Don't take that number anyway. And uh, we all live on Google most of the time. So they are happy to give away, get rid of that traffic right in their, bar, in their pop. Right? And Google is very happy because they don't have to pay the rent. Now, with that win-win situation, Google looks at your packet data, and they can really look at your data, and they can decide whether it has to be sent here, there, where, and so on and so forth. They do all that. And they have their own network, by the way, Google Ban. So they can do it because they have Google dollars. Now, the question is, what about you and me and the Bank of America? They, Bank of America is rich, but they don't have Google dollars either. So they would love to go to some, some carrier and say, please, you know, do this for me, what Google does. So that is where our solution comes in, open ADN. Open application delivery. Basically, you can put your VNFs or NFs anywhere on any cloud. And of course, there will be a box at the ISP which can belong, in this case, to the ISP itself, not to Google. And then ISP can somehow send the packet to the right places. OK? And um, so this would, be, and this would be, everybody would be happy in this case. Obviously, the, uh, by the way, Google can do this too. Google can offer this service. And they will probably be the first one. I would not be surprised if they offered this service. But we are hoping that some other people will think of the similar things, and they can start offering this kind of service. And so what does it take? Well, it takes a lot of technical work, which I will not go into this presentation, because I mean, obviously, this is not the right place. We have written papers. And if you pick up the latest issue of IEEE Communication Magazine this month, November 2013, you will find our article in there. And the paper is actually referenced again. So there are lots of things that we have to do. It's not trivial. All right? We use SDN. We change the open flow. We do cross-layer communication and all that. And I, I, I will leave that for, you, for those of you who are technical-minded to read that paper. But the simple idea is as follows. Every tenant has a controller. 
and the ISP has a controller. The tenant tells what, how it wants to handle its part of the apartment, a set of apartment that it owns. It could be in multiple clouds. So it has its own virtual network and it just has a controller to just tell its device, virtual devices, VNFs, middle boxes and everything else, how to handle my traffic. But it cannot change any of them because they are all belong to the ISP. So the controller talks to the ISP's controller. ISP's controller can change the infrastructure. And, and then basically, the way this communication takes place is important because it cannot say that, well, if it is SD video, do this, if ND video, do this, because that will require looking into the packet. Right? So you cannot, you just can tell your apartment owner or your building owner that please send me if the packet looks big, send it this way, if it's small, you know, some characteristic which does not declare the content. Right? So how do you do that? So that is where the cross layer communication comes in. But anyway, the idea is that you don't have to change to SDN means you don't have to change the whole world. You don't have to change the whole network. You just put one or two, three or four boxes at some places, critical places. You can start with three or four boxes. That's all. Because they're centrally controlled. When they see the packet, they will send it to the right place and the things will happen. When hundreds of these are there, they will happen much better. When thousands of these are there, they will happen even much better. All right? So you don't need to change the world. And this is all at the edge. Most of the stuff does not need to be changed. Everything below does not need to be changed. All right, so this is another part of our solution, is that only few modules in the edge are necessary. So the key features of OpenADN are that we change only edge devices. And um, so you can do it now. First of all, we don't really need you to take out the brain or anything like that. All we have to do is we have to basically make sure that the devices that are handling our packet understand our protocol. And so you have to implement our protocol. And then it can be done now. Coexistence, our packets can go on the old internet, and old internet can go on our packets and our uh, this one devices. Incremental deployment, you can just do it, um, you know, like two boxes at a time. In economic incentive for the first adopters, people who who do it first, buy the first box, they don't have to sit down and, buy, and hope that somebody else will buy it. Right? And the resource managers keep complete control of their resources. So nobody gives control of their resources to anybody. Now, this is what I learned at Digital Equipment Corporation, because I, you know, and Dave, <laughs> who is here in the audience, knows Dave Tony Lark. He taught us that basically you have to design architectures like this so that they can change. And Ethernet was designed by that group in which I was there. And Dave was there, I suppose, too, in those days, right? So, we designed Ethernet from day one to the day end today by using this principle. Some versions of IP and you know which versions have not followed those principles, so they're still waiting for the world to change. All right? So resource control, tenants keep complete control of the application data. NSP keep complete control of the equipment. The another part is the VFs and middle boxes can be located anywhere in the world. However, you would be crazy to put your controller in China when your business is in America, right? I mean, so you can do that, but it's just better that you put everything in one country. So that is all taken care of. NSPs and, and tenants can own, or and now here's the thing, who owns those modules? Either one. The tenants can make up, the, if, the, if the ISP doesn't offer this service, by the way, I'm using the word NSP here because NSP is the infrastructure provider. ISP could be the provider or the user. One of the two. And no changes to the core internet. So we don't have to change 4 billion devices. So everybody wins. The vendors win, the tenants win, the NSPs win, the CSPs win. So here is another idea, is the CSPs. Cloud service provider, particularly the big ones, which have cloud services all over the world and which have you know, Google dollars, they can provide this service too. Right? And so with that, I want to basically give you the summary. The six key points. First is, technology is thrashing. What that means is it is changing so fast that you, know, you find, if you look at you know, something tomorrow and say, wait a minute, how come I didn't know about this? 
and so that is what is happening to you guys, that is happening to our, us guys, that is happening to our students. Our students, they are doing PhD for three years, and there is nothing that lasts for three years. Within one year, they are out of date while they are still studying. <laughs> right? They go to industry interview and they say, well, do you know about this? This, they say, no, sorry, this was not taught to us. Because how can we teach them? It takes three years to write a book. So, so that is really the technology is moving so fast nowadays that um, it's kind of you know, causing all these issues. But anyway, given that, we have to live with that. And now the second thing is really where the programmability comes in, where the virtualization alone does not help, is this dynamics. Things are changing. So with virtualization, you get most of the benefit, a lot of benefits that you need. But if you want to change program things, you know, so then you need some little bit brain in the central place. It doesn't have to be brain of the people who are being controlled, but a centralized controller. Right? Then virtual functions are useful. The third message I wanted to give was that VNF or NFV, really we should remove the word N. It is not just your problem. It is the world's problem, and you can help it if you are a carrier. And if you are a vendor, you can just sell it to other people. Actually, it will be much easier to sell it to Bank of America than to sell it to a carrier because, as I said, they are much more, and the, the enterprise market is much more nimble. Tenants can share, and so the, basically tenants can share the, the whole infrastructure. They can specify their policies. NSPs can keep complete control over their resources, and tenants can keep control over tra their traffic, and then it can be done now. So we are not waiting for a new thing to be done or you know, everybody to change or you know, so on and so forth. All right? I think that's the end of it. I do have this reference, which is actually appeared in IEEE Communication Magazine this month. Um, by the way, this URL is at the bottom. You cannot, I don't know whether you can read it or not. Uh, I will bring it back to the beginning. You can read it here. The talk is there. So the whole slides are there. You don't have to take any pictures. We are all, being university, we are all open. We have nothing confidential. And so if you want to see all those cartoons all over again, just download it. Any questions? <laughs> Fill up your homework night. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, really, I mean, this is the, the homework is to figure it out how to use. See, so think you have to extend the, whatever concept you have. And I see people after people pre preaching what they have been, somebody else has preached them before. So the homework is to extend that. And that is what the, so one of the homework was how do you remove N and who can use it? I think that is a very simple thing to do for your own industry, for whatever industry you are doing, whatever you are doing. Same thing for carriers, same thing for vendors. Any other question? Come on. It's, it's not that hard. <laughs> Any agreement? All in favor. Eh? All in favor, say aye. <laughs> Two people. All right. So. <laughs> So I used to go to the standards meeting, and this was a standard thing. You know, all in favor say aye. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. <laughs>